Forty-five years ago, childhood friends Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield took a $12,000 investment and opened a small ice cream shop in Burlington, Vermont. That small shop grew into one of the most iconic brands in the business. Known for their unique flavors with creative names, Ben & Jerry's has dominated the ice cream game for almost half a century. I had the opportunity to speak with the ice cream tycoons while they were in Stillwater as guests of OSU Speakers Board. This is our conversation. How did you two initially meet? Ben and I met in junior high school in seventh grade. Uh, we were in the same school and we grew up uh, running around the track together in gym class. We were at the back of the pack because we were the two slowest, fattest kids in the class. You get pretty friendly with whoever else is in the back of the pack with you. I mean, way in the back of the pack. I read that you took a $5 ice cream course at Penn State. What did that course teach you both about the ice cream business? Well, uh, for one thing, we didn't really have any money, so we split one course between the two of us. And um, it was a correspondence course. They used to have that in the old days, <coughs> before the internet. Uh, what did it teach us? that it all begins with the cow, that you got to have great milk, great raw ingredients if you want to make great ice cream. What did you learn from the course? We learned that the way we were going to be making ice cream was termed obsolete. <laughs> we were starting being obsolete. You know, we started with a homemade ice cream shop. And so we were making ice cream in uh, an old-fashioned rock salt and ice ice cream freezer, which, you know, the kind you use at home when, when you're growing up. And, uh, you know, all, all the information in, in the class we were learning just kept saying it was obsolete. We were dinosaurs, I don't know, beyond dinosaurs. Uh, but that did not deter us. We were retro. Uh... But, I mean, essentially, the course was about how to maximize your profits as an ice cream manufacturer. And that involved uh, using a whole lot of air to pump up the ice cream so that you're <coughs> selling kind of half ice cream, half air. And <coughs> using a bunch of chemicals uh, to make the ice cream kind of taste uh, smoother and creamier without using as much... Uh, cream, which is kind of the expensive part, and so it wasn't really applicable to to what we were trying to do. But um, you know, we we did learn some basics about you know ice cream formulation. How much business experience did you have when you first started distributing your ice cream to mom and pop shops? Zero. How much did you have? Yeah, zero. Zero. How did you make it work? You know, uh, a lot of business, most of business, is common sense and a whole lot of really, really hard work. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think people start businesses now and they, they get outside investors and venture capital and stuff and they hire people. That's not how we did it. Uh, we, you know, we bootstrapped it and, you know, we, we opened on an investment of... Uh, four thousand dollars a piece and you know ended up doing all the renovations ourselves and buying uh, you know used equipment at auctions and part of it is we started as a little ice cream shop so it was not a giant business uh, it was very small scale and uh, I don't know that you really had to know that much we were kind of shopkeepers and so it was very hands-on and I think as the business grew and got into other areas, we brought on people that had more business experience than we had. You know, we, Ben and I are very good at some things. Uh, Ben's incredibly creative, great with flavors. I am good on follow through. We're both terrible managers and we're not good with business, but we found people who were really good. Your first ever store was in Vermont. Why Vermont? Well, uh, I was working at 
uh, a school for disturbed teenagers in the Adirondacks. It was a residential school, and it was in a very, very rural area in the Adirondack uh, Forest Preserve. Um, and on our, on our days off, the staff would go to Burlington, Vermont, because it was kind of like the nearest uh, city. And Burlington, Vermont's a, a beautiful place. It's a college town. Um, and originally, when uh, Jerry and I decided to you know, open up a homemade ice cream shop, we thought it would be nice to locate in a warm place. Uh, but all the warm places already had homemade ice cream shops, and we didn't really want to compete. Uh, so we ended up in Burlington, Vermont, the only state in the Union that didn't have a Baskin Robbins at the time. Yeah, I'm not sure people here in Oklahoma know where Vermont is even. Uh, right, right near Canada. Yeah, so, so Burlington is an hour south of the Canadian border. And, uh, you know, as Ben said, it was so cold there all the time, it didn't make sense to have an ice cream shop for some. It's a very short season, as they say. Ice cream is a year-round thing. You know, you can never, you can never. It is, but not if you're standing outside <laughs> and it's uh, minus 20 degrees. You. There's nothing like ice cream in New England in the summer. That is correct. I mean, New England is, uh, I think, one of the higher per capita consumption areas of the country for, for ice cream. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of counterintuitive. I mean, Alaska is pretty good for ice cream consumption, too. I mean, the colder it gets, it seems like the more ice cream people eat. Uh, maybe it's because, you know, when the weather breaks, finally, in the spring, in the summer, they just can't wait. You know, it's really high in Utah also mm -hmm. because uh, people don't drink there as much. They eat more ice cream. No, nothing wrong with a lot of ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> what you both are probably most known for, for is your inventive flavors. How much research goes into coming up with a new flavor? Well, in my day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when was that, that your day? <laughs> well, we opened in 78. It was around then. Uh, I Did you hear that? 1978, that's when we opened. So people think, oh, Ben and Jerry, 45 years ago. We're old. Yeah, we're old. <laughs> they know it. that. They can see us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was channeling flavors from the collective flavor unconscious. It was just clear to me that there were, uh, there were these flavors that 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 were in people's subconscious that uh, they wanted to eat. And I was able to get in touch with that. And, um, it, you know, I was essentially making flavors I wanted to eat. Yeah, so the way it worked was I was making all the ice cream, but Ben was coming up with all the flavors. So he would come up, say, can you make this flavor? I would try to make it. Ben would say, well, it's pretty good, but the chunks need to be bigger, there needs to be more flavor, and, you know, when Ben was finally satisfied, we knew the flavor was good. He had a very high bar. Ben has high standards. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of it is because uh, I don't really have much of a sense of smell. I'm, I'm somewhat uh, suffering from anosmia since I was a little, little kid. And you know, smell is very associated with taste. And so I don't really taste the way other people taste. And in order for me to perceive something, it needs to be really, really strongly flavored. And, and in order, and because I, I don't taste that well, I'm very focused on mouthfeel, the, the texture of the ice cream. And I really got off on uh, the contrast between, uh, you know, big, crunchy chunks and the smooth, creamy ice cream. Yeah. So, you know, I think when, when you talk about flavors, I think that is the thing people want to talk about most about Ben and & Jerry's and us. I mean, 
everybody's got their favorite flavor. Uh, they want to know why their favorite flavor disappeared. They want to know why we're not making a flavor that they want. They, they just, people have very strong feelings about flavors. My mom's favorite was Rainforest Crunch. Ooh, that was excellent. Excellent, <laughs> she, excellent flavor. she was upset that it went away. As but my dad, well as she should be. Chunky Monkey and Cherry Garcia. And I'm a fish food gal, so those are pretty loyal and true, as we say yeah, at Oklahoma State. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is not going to help anybody, but we will be scooping Chunky, uh, Chunky Monkey tonight. I'll have some for my parents who are in Pennsylvania. You for know, people that are honor. watching. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's amazing that, you know, that you're still talking about Rainforest Crunch because, you know, that flavor got discontinued way back in the last millennium. Um, and it was so good that, yeah, there, I've run into a bunch of people who still talk about it. And I, I don't know why the company hasn't brought it back yet. But if I was running the zoo, <laughs> <laughs> it would be back. Do you guys have favorite flavors that you've created? Yeah. Uh, I keep on um, evolving. Uh, so it used to be Heath Bar Crunch, and then it was Cherry Garcia, and then New York Super Fudge Chunk. And, uh, Some people call that changing your mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's evolving. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I got into a salted caramel core flip phase. And uh, Chubby Hubby, you know, I mean. Love Chubby Hubby. Yeah. So good. Yeah. I, I think Chubby Hubby is still, still really in the rotation for me. So my favorite flavor is Americone Dream, vanilla ice cream with a caramel swirl and fudge covered pieces of waffle cones. But you asked a favorite flavor that I created. And, uh, you know, one of the things that most people don't realize is I have never created a flavor at Ben & Jerry's. Look at the expression on your face. That's surprising. He just happened to have produced all the flavors. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to think it up. It's hard to make it happen. When I was in college, I actually worked at a Ben & Jerry's in downtown Boston. Uh -huh. So I am one of your former employees. Ah. And well, the best thank you part, for scooping. <laughs> yes. Which shop were you at? By Park Plaza Hotel. Uh huh. And we got free ice cream every shift. Whenever you worked, you could eat the ice cream. So the best part was sampling all the flavors. But I'd always resort back to fish food or half-baked. Those are my two. We're also scooping half-baked tonight. You're, you're <laughs> it's meant to be. You're very young. Those are young people's fla flavors. My parents always have uh, Chunky Monkey, though, so I do eat Chunky Monkey when I go home. Well, it's good for breakfast. Mm. You know, the bananas. bananas, walnuts, <laughs> milk. It's like yogurt. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, the holidays are coming up. What are your favorite holiday flavors that you've created? I was thinking about that. Oh, cranberry walnut. It was cranberry ice cream with walnuts in it. It was a beautiful, beautiful color. It was slightly purplish. So the best flavor for the holidays the company ever made was Festivus. Are you familiar with yes. the Seinfeld episode Festivus? Uh, and they only did it for, for one season because I think the, the people from the Seinfeld people only gave them permission to do it once. But it, it was incredible. I'm not sure if everybody here you know, knows Seinfeld or Festivus. It, it's an alternative holiday. Uh, it starts with the airing of grievances. And <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Is there any holiday flavor that you would like to make? You know, we made sugar plum. <laughs> That's one we wish we hadn't made. We hired some guy, a marketing guy once, and uh, he was an old guy, and uh, you know, probably about how old I am now. And uh, he had this idea that we should come out with a flavor called sugar plum. And, you know, everybody knows about sugar plum. You know, it, it comes from the nutcracker sweet. But the reality is there's no such thing as a sugar plum. We've researched it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the guy thought it up. He thought it was fiction. You know, the nutcracker sweet is, is fiction. <laughs> and <laughs> sugar plums are fiction. <laughs> and plums don't 
really sell that well in ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> what about like a hot chocolate or a gingerbread or a candy cane? We're like workshopping here. Right. Well, you know, when I was a kid, uh, my favorite flavor was from Howard Johnson's, uh, 28 flavors. And, uh, and I like peppermint stick. I, 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 liked, I thought that was great. You know, when we were uh, just an ice cream shop in the beginning, we used to make ginger snap ice cream, which was delicious. It was really good. It was delicious for people who like soggy cookies. <laughs> <laughs> He's a soggy cookie guy. What about like a gingerbread dough? Sort of like a cookie Ooh, dough, but a gingerbread yes, dough? Yes, yes, idea. yes. Yeah. That is a great idea. It would um, enter the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the hall of dough. The, the, you know, we came out with chocolate chip cookie dough. Ben and Jerry has actually invented chocolate chip cookie dough. And, you know, now most every company makes chocolate chip cookie dough. I mean, it, it's interesting. I mean, everybody grew up, uh, their moms making, uh, you know, chocolate chip cookies. And, you know, they're trying to eat the dough. The mom is slapping their hand with the, with the wooden spoon. And we gave people permission to eat raw cookie dough. And it was big. Still is big. What advice do you have for students when it comes to pursuing their passions? Do it. Don't listen to these people that are saying, oh, that's not practical. Uh, you know, you're never going to make any money at it. Uh, the, the value of pursuing your passion, of doing something that you love, doing something that's, you know, feeds your heart and your soul and your spirit is invaluable. Uh, you know, I mean, pe a lot of people work to get money to spend it on stuff that they think is then going to make them happy. And, you know, that's expensive. <laughs> it costs a lot of money to buy whatever stuff you think you need to make you happy. If what you're doing with your life is making you happy and you're getting paid for it, although, you know, not a lot, but you, you don't need to go buy all this crap to fill up the void that's created when you're at this job that is soul draining. Yeah, I think, you know, the other thing that, that worked for Ben and me is uh, you don't have to wait until you have everything figured out before you start. I think often people feel like they need to know more than they know and they need to get it all set up and for better or worse, I think we did a lot of learning on the job. If you wait till you have it all figured out, you're never going to do it. Leap and the net will appear. Thank you to the OSU Speakers Board for hosting Ben and Jerry on campus. I hope they enjoyed their time in Stillwater as much as I enjoyed our conversation. I can't wait to see what flavors they come up with next. To find the ice cream shop nearest to you, visit benjerry.com.